All right, guys, welcome back, RX Radio. Uh, probably our most requested guest of all the last couple of years. I want to say of all time, but definitely the last couple of years. Uh, long time coming, Kasim Hansen, creator, founder. I don't know, what does it say on his Instagram page? The creator. I'm going to go creator, N1 Education. So, um, expert in biomechanics, really interesting chat. Uh, Cass and I dove into some concepts around uh, stability, hypertrophy, exercise selection. Probably the more in, one of the more in-depth practical conversations that we've had on the podcast on the topic. Super interested to have him on. Those of you who might be familiar uh, with some of his content, he's always ends up in these bullshit podcasts where people are trying to just like get him, but kept it open for him, keep, kept it super high level. Uh, it was really cool to wrap with him. Uh, met him at uh, Swiss last year. Uh, so if you guys are looking into anything N1, uh, we got in person. So he has a ridiculous facility. He's kitted out with uh, all his, uh, I don't want to say specially designed equipment, but definitely has a lot of modifications and equipment you're not going to find anywhere else. Uh, schedule real quick. And I believe they're in the Colorado, in Colorado, I think Denver. Uh, February 17th, Transformation Camp. February 24th, Biomechanics Practical. We'll put the um, the link for the in-person events as well as his online stuff in the show notes. Uh, guys, do enjoy the podcast. Super fun. We'll probably have Cass back on. Might even run something in person together. Uh, interesting outlook on training to failure. A um, lot of hot topic contentious issues in the fitness space we dive into. So hope you guys enjoy. We'll see you next week. You're tuned in to RX Radio. I have not actually. I need to. Really? Ah, but I have Super interesting. So like, I'm not going to give it away, but like there's a scene where he's like laughing hysterically and he clearly has some sort of mental disorder and he's on a bus and the lady in front of him gets all mad. And as she gets mad at him, he starts laughing more and he hands a laminated cue card to the lady explaining like, hey, I have this condition. I feel like podcast intros should should be that in our industry like <laughs> here man just read this i've done it before and uh i think you're at a point now where uh, you need no introduction even though i'm going to do one for you after this so Casim hansen welcome to the show thanks for thanks for your time man. awesome glad to be here can i uh most i think you're creeping up as most requested guest of all time really okay thoughts well, that's cool um I mean, either I'm doing something very right or very wrong. It could be could be either extreme there, right? And I, you know what? I think it's that it's that deference that puts you in that spot. It's the it's the ability to see full circle, um, mm -hmm. which I think is kind of going to be the the central theme of stuff we want to talk about today. I don't think I don't think anyone is interested in either of our opinions on global politics. I don't think anyone. We might have them. Uh, that's what close friends Instagram stories are for. Uh, I don't think anyone has an opinion on our view of restaurants or, uh, I think people are really interested to know your thoughts on exercise. And I thought, you know, speaking with you at Swiss, uh, obviously we've been back and forth in, in many a spirited DM conversation. I think it'd be useful to just kind of throw you the reins and throw some topics and like two dogs with a bone, just kind of have at it for the betterment of the, of the listener and understanding. Um, so there's a handful of topics that we discussed prior to the show, and, and I'm sure it'll kind of spin off into an organic conversation. Um, we might even not get through a single question, but uh, I figured starting off, you know, so many hot topics du jour in the industry. Uh, I think the conversation around failure is one that in my tenure in the fitness industry so far, I've seen surface a handful of times with different opinions and different thoughts. Um, I think maybe let's put a fine point on it and really, and really landscape the topography just so we're on equal ground. Training to failure as far as uh, the return of your investment of training time for muscle hypertrophy, stimulus and adaptation. Your thoughts? Okay. Um, you know, when I look at failure, I think that a lot of people look at it as like it's this... Uh, it's this binary that we can apply to everything. Um, and so like, okay, what for, like, if we're looking at hypertrophy, what are we trying to actually accomplish with that? And then, okay, how close does failure get me to that? Because if I look at failure from a nuanced approach, I'm not going to consider for the quadriceps failure in a squat 
the same way that I would consider failure in the leg extension in terms of how the quadriceps are leaving that set from a physiological standpoint. Because to me, I'm looking at, well, what is the limiter, you know, and how close to the physiological stimulus did I get before I hit that limiter? And I think from our hypertrophy perspective, that's how we should be gauging like whether or not, you know, actually taking an exercise to like crippling level failure is probably going to be productive is, is the limiter, the thing that's actually going to cause failure, the thing that's also going to cause me like, you know, it's like, does stimulus match the fatigue in terms of, in terms of that exercise? So if we look at a squat, well, why did I stop the squat? Was it, you know, it just became too technically challenging. Was there a respiratory challenge? You know, was it, you know, spinal erectors? Was it hip extension? It's like, there's so many things that could literally stop you from being able to do the exercise, especially if you're using technical failure before we get to muscular failure. So in terms of the, whether or not the reward is worth it, I think it depends partly on the exercise selection and how close that exercise is so that the limiter of the exercise is the muscle tissue that you want the hypertrophy in. And the less, you know, the less close that is, then probably the more fatigue cost that's coming as you approach failure. Like we, we typically see like in our lab is that compensation increases closer to failure. And that's both intramuscularly and across multiple joints. Like no matter how you look at it, as we get closer to cl closer to failure, more of the adjacent tissue is starting to help. And if we're in a more biased exercise, well, there's simply less things that can help. And so there's less fatigue costs of pushing to failure. That's why like, okay, you can do tons of sets of leg extensions and not experience as much fatigue as you can in things that have more of a global movement pattern, like a squat pattern, right? Um, so whether it's worth it, I think one is based off of what exercises you pick. And then I think the other aspect of it too is, is that you just have to understand that, you know, when we're looking at hypertrophy, I look at this as like, it's just a dosage thing. So people look at mechanical tension as being the main driver, um, but it's with mechanical tension, we have both magnitude and then just like the amount of time we're within that tension. So it's a combination of quantity and intensity of that, that we need. Right. And I think that when we're training to failure, basically we're trying to improve the, like we're trying to get more out of a single set. So there's always going to be this inverse relationship with volume. So whether or not the juice for the, for the squeeze might be like, well, how many sets do you have to work with? And then is it worth it or is it not worth it? And I think that's, that's a thing that is probably very, intuitively applied by most people. But, you know, when it comes to the debate, people kind of like, they leave out that gray area and just go to one extreme or the other, right? When we look at skill as an overarching term, that would mean that we're less likely or can push further to due to the capacity of co-contracting muscles, like I said, let's say in a squat, right? Someone is a good squatter, someone's a bad squatter. Mm -hmm. Is it obviously the the, the stimulus afforded to us in a more isolated setting, like a quad extension versus like say a barbell front squat. Um, does efficacy scale with skill when dealing with muscular co-contraction, exercises that need to be more internally stabilized? Like can someone over time, as they get better at a squat, make that squat a more efficient stimulus uh, for the quads as spinal erectors start to come up to snuff, as the... Uh, uh, the co-contraction that occurs in keeping the spine upright, the pelvis in a certain position, the, the less likely they to succumb to a technical failure is, does this map on a timeline? Like, does this map on a timeline of lifting age and skill? So if we isolate the principle, I'd say that yes, skill closes the gap on that. Like if, if you simply, if you could take a person, wave a wand and instantly give them better technique, then then we would expect that that physique or the, the fatigue would be more specific to the thing that we're going from. The problem with looking at like applying that principle of time is that's not the only thing that scales, right? Strength also scales. And then just the, this sheer amount of loading that you're using and stuff like that also scales with that. So, you know, you could argue that, all right, well, the person that's not skilled also is managing significantly lighter loads. So, okay, maybe it's actually easier for them to compensate with their quads, you know, you know, in terms of like what's working when or their glutes or their spinal erectors, or it's just not as demanding on those other tissues. So not much is being asked. So it kind of meets the skill maybe a little bit. And then, 
as a person gets more advanced, their skill improves, but also they're just simply managing heavier and heavier loads. So basically like the buffering space that they have is smaller. So I would say on principle, yeah, you know, it does scale with skill, but it may be marginal when you account for the fact that loading and stuff is also going up. Like a person's just able to not only recruit the muscle more, but it's like, okay, if I'm squatting a heavier load, it's that much more of a respiratory challenge. It's that much more of a, you know, balance challenge, right? Like the degrees of error that you can have at each joint get smaller and smaller as we start working with higher loads, the change in, you know, all you have to do is like change your tempo just a little bit. And when we have a larger load, all of a sudden that's a much bigger physics problem for the body to handle. Right. Right. Now, one thing we kind of mentioned and touched on before is reproducibility of effort, just kind of like some overview, like in, like in a, in the strength conditioning world, we'd call it re repeated sprint ability. I guess in some ways we would look at this closest proxy in resistance training to maybe how people use velocity based training in mm -hmm. powerlifting settings where it's like, okay, I'm staying within a range. I'm still driving a particular stimulus and hopefully deriving an adapting or a particular adaptation. If we, I mean, this will likely plot alongside skill in some cases, but if we take someone who's in, let's stick with the squat for simplicity's sake, and we go, okay, you know, we're going to teach this person a squat or squat variation. And if you can push that variation, say better suited to a novice client, something like a goblet squat or uh, even a Smith machine squat, where you're starting to meet them where they're at in their ability to co-contract and externally stabilize where they're, where they're kind of lacking. You could take someone to a point where they probably couldn't stand up and you see it in commercial gyms, right? The crippling muscular failure. Where does the ability to recover interset start to plot along the dosage of stimulus repetitions towards failure? I'm not sure if I said that really clear, but where does reproducibility of high quality effort start to to peak and then does it have a drop off i mean there's certainly like there's there's bodybuilders both natural and enhanced that can continually push the needle into that uh, effective rep range but how much is necessary for stimulus and how much is overshooting it and is overshooting just kind of where yeah, hey we're looking we're we're looking to incur too much compensation through surrounding muscles that might not be hand be able to handle that tolerate that type of load cross section layer your position in the exercise how do we, is there a way to use performance to monitor dose? I think when we are looking for performance based goals, that there's a very strong correlation with hypertrophy, things get pretty muddy. And this is where like all the research on volume and stuff, especially like we have a new meta-analysis now and the people worked up to like 52 sets of, of quads or whatever, and still somehow that group that did and an insane amount of volume somehow managed to still eke out some benefit from that volume. So from the hypertrophy lens, I think it's less clear, like what we kind of like, it's probably better for standardization of like, okay, how far do I want to push on a given day? than it is for knowing like, Hey, you know, is this the point that like, I'm no longer making progress, but still with the overlying principle of like, look, your second set isn't going to produce as much stimulus as the first and your third is not as much like it's going to be a diminishing returns, but do we ever actually reach a point from a hypertrophy perspective where we actually run into that wall? Like what is the ceiling that's become less clear locally. And I think where we're like the evidence is leading me to is, is that most people probably run into a systemic limit before they run into the local tissue actually being the limiter there, which then means that this is probably not a very good proxy for hypertrophy, right? Because usually that's, that, that's kind of what we're going, but it could be a proxy for a hypertrophy program overall in terms of just managing your systemic volume, right? But it might not tell you like, well, hey, what if I dropped off some sets of another body part? Would then I be able to like throw these in here, even though that like, you know, set after set, I'm getting less and less performance that might still be beneficial. And that's kind of what the like super high volume research tends to lead towards is like, Hey, if we're just training really high volume for one muscle, so that it's like, we're not doing it across the whole body, which would be a huge systemic increase. If we're just doing it like for a one muscle group potentially the ceiling, you know, in terms of like the diminishing returns on a set, like you could be at like 40% performance for the same relative rep range and effort. 
and still be getting a little bit more stimulus and a little bit more progress. It's just the dosage, like the per set stimulus is just going to be dropping, 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 dropping. But there might not be an actual, like a reasonable endpoint that we know right now. But I mean, the, the difficult part there would be extrapolating that isolated principle into a into a concurrent program where you're training more than just one muscle, right? Yes. Then recoverability will ultimately be the bottleneck, right? And we kind of see this anecdotally with, you know, professional bodybuilders with really dominant muscle groups and their like legs, for example, or is probably the easiest one to pick on where people, I mean, again, anecdotally will cut the frequency of the muscle group that is more uh, d demanding of the recovery resources being finite and then start to see an ability to grow with no other change in their program. Like, hey, I train legs less, I train upper body more, my leg size is maintaining, and now I'm actually able to partition resources of recovery to my upper body. And you know, it sounds like you, you're taking that isolated principle and extrapolating it out, you're going to and you're going to run into the confines of reality at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean. I, I think like that, that. I think that's a perfect example of like, hey, can can we move around what we're doing throughout the body so that we maintain kind of a a similar systemic fatigue, but just partition the local fatigue where we want it. To me, that's that's where the evidence is leading, and you know, and also what we see see in practice too. I mean, it, it gives the it gives a credence for hey, specialization phases are probably more useful, especially as you start getting to the point where your training volume or frequencies are starting to get higher. Like at a certain point, you probably just can't recover from pushing everything to a significant level, right? Like you, you're going to have to start, you know, prioritizing things for blocks, right? Because it's just, too, you're, you're probably, you're, you're probably pushing at the limit of your recovery threshold too much that like your ability to go past it is so easy if you're trying to train everything at a higher amount of volume, but it becomes much easier to manage when you only have to kind of track one thing, right? When you mentioned fatigue, local and global, and it's mm -hmm. something that I've always kind of wondered is like, when we look at the, the less efficient in isolation exercises that challenging particular muscles, because they demand a lot of co-contraction, squats, spinal erectors, uh, abdominals, every, name everything that, you, you know, mm -hmm. from shoulder position of your shoulder to position of your toes, where you compare it to a quad extension. People with a greater training capacity seem to be able to put on muscle across the board, whether it's your ability to recover interset or intercession, the idea of co-contraction and fatigue at a local level, do you see much weight in programming to push that threshold? Like, hey, I understand that these exercises in the short term are not necessarily going to be the highest return on the investment of our time and training as far as local stimulus and hypertrophy, but they're, you know, they're integrated and coordinated and might cause or drive more of that systemic fatigue in in putting together these more compound movements and that's a threshold we are going to need to push higher right you know i, I kind of think of the early days of like my i remember my first personal training evaluation and this is just an idea i've kind of been flushing out of my head as late it's like we everyone's familiar with the sound bite of motor unit recruitment Right, like we, you know, the, the newbie gains and this idea that, you know, as you start lifting weights and putting a greater demand on the muscle, we're not going through some sort of like hyperplasia process. We're not growing new muscle per se. We're starting to stimulate the muscle that's there. Like if, you know, the car fell on your child, you know, there'd be some insurgence of norepinephrine and epinephrine. You'd be able to lift the car. Could you go the next day and do a car deadlift with 900 pounds? Like probably not. Early stage adaptation, motor unit recruitment, we see an increase in strength. Now that's within a muscle itself. That's intramuscular. Intermuscular, as far as like learning how to co-contract muscles, I kind of look at that as like potentially the next wave of strength, or maybe we can just call it efficiency, mm -hmm. but that's going to be more local or globally fatiguing. Do you see there being a need to purposefully put in exercises in the continuum of long-term progress, if we understand that local fatigue and that that driving engine of uh, uh, like neurological output, let's say, could bottleneck someone, even though we're not going to see a immediate or a more immediate return uh, 
than a more local stimulus. Is, is that is that line of thought kind of like is that landing? It's literally an idea that I've been thinking. Like, I want to ask the cast this. Yeah. Um, so if if I'm interpreting the question right, I mean, are you asking that you know? Is, is there a case for doing exercises that are more integrated and have a higher intramuscular demand? Is, is that kind of how you're phrasing yeah. it? Like, like, like if I were to spin it up totally in my language, it would be like, all right, deliberately practicing skills that require people to have more uh, internal stability, drive more output coordination and co-contraction, understanding that, look, we're probably not going to get the return on the stimulus now, but if they can learn how to squat and they can start squatting more, we're going to narrow that margin like you spoke about earlier. And then and maybe, and this is a, a question for a bit later, maybe we'll actually see a return on our output and ability to co-contract and internally stabilize on more externally stabilized high output machines like press, hamstring, curl, quad mm-hmm. extension, things like that. So the way I look at, and basically the term that I use is just integrated exercises, right? You know, so it's like, okay, like if I take a chest supported row and I remove the chest support, that's increasing the integration of the things that need to be working, you know, to do that exercise or whatnot. Um, And I think like if we're looking through the lens of just hypertrophy, can you make the argument that using those exercises is going to be better or provide some benefit? If we're looking at a scenario with no constraints, I'd be like, no, just train the local tissue. That's that's all you need to do. The challenge there is, though, is that when we're programming with, you know, in the real world, people don't have an infinite amount of time, an infinite number of exercises. And even though they might have hypertrophy as a goal, they do still have a certain amount of function and they're not going to be doing every exercise all of the time. So integrated movements can help you get more things done in a set. Like I look at them as like, we're moving from a scalpel to more of a Swiss army knife on a continuum, like of like what a set accomplishes, right? So an exercise that's going to challenge more tissues. Well, I may not be able to get the same magnitude of stimulus in a single tissue, but I may be able to get more total stimulus because I'm able to use more tissue. Now, when we look at the skill component, the co-contraction and stability of the joints, when you're including integrated exercises, you're probably in a position where your ability to transition between exercises and movement patterns is going to have less of a lag. So like if you go through a mezzo and you're doing all very, very isolated based movements, and then you switch to another mezzo and you're doing different movements and you've been doing nothing that's in any way integrated, there may be a little bit longer learning curve as you're rolling into those other exercises. So I think that like maintaining a a little bit of integrated work just makes you a little bit more flexible with how well you can adapt to new motor patterns because you have at least some foundational stability skills and stuff like that to build on versus doing none of them, right? Like we've all seen bodybuilders that do like basically nothing that I, you know, but isolation work. And then, you know, they try and move like to do any sort of normal daily activity. And it's, you know, just kind of comical to watch. Um, so I think that's where like, that's, that's the example of like, well, you know, if you, if you don't use it, you lose it thing. And that happens with just move, movement patterns as a whole too. Right. So if you've been doing say, you know, just like leg extensions or, you know, only pendulum squats or whatnot. And then all of a sudden you're going to switch to a split squat or something else like that. If you were incorporating something in your program where you already having to manage balance, you would be better adapted to jump into that versus if you'd only been doing stabilized machine work. Do you feel like, a, and I've noticed this with whether it's strength sport, strength sport athletes or bodybuilders, it's, there's something to be said for uh, physical and mental developmental milestones as an adolescent. Like you take kids who are actual athletes and you put them into bodybuilding later, the transition and the lag, as you mentioned, and the, just the, the, the ex- ability to express across multiple planes of movement and coordinate in time, you know, things that are more often uh, linked with athleticism, as we know, rhythm, coordination, timing. Like if there is an athletic component to hypertrophy, it might be, as you mentioned, like hey, your ability to hop in an exercise and really narrow that learning curve and, and narrow that margin. Uh, 
is that something you might factor in? Like say we have two bodybuilders, similar composition, uh, similar relative training age, but one has, you throw one guy a basketball and he's Steph Curry. You throw another one and he like stubs his finger and fractures it and he tapes it to tape to the other one. It's like, hmm, I might look to buffer this gap or is that a, is that a, is a non, you know, uh, outcome significant variable you think? I think that's a... I think that's probably a weak anecdote. If, if if like if I if I'm taking the counter view of that, you know, I've seen plenty of cases where, you know, the kid that looks like he never picked up anything and then all of a sudden just joins the gym and then like 6 months later looks like a totally different human even though he didn't have like any movement pattern or whatever, right? Um and, you know, I think you know, it's 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 hard to remove the fact that like if you did athletic things younger, you actually built a better platform. Like you, you already have adaptations. One, you simply just have more muscle cells and you have, you know, a higher ribosomal count and you have all these other adaptations that are somewhat going to be beneficial. And also like sports also kind of have a selection process built in, right? Like, you know, if you're absolutely terrible at putting on muscle, chances are you're, your sport career isn't going to go that great anyway. Cause like there you like every sport requires some sort of strength, you know, um, and there's going to be a muscular component to that. So I think it's really hard to remove those signals from that anecdote. So, I mean, could like, Definitely, I wouldn't say, hey, you know, if you want to be a bodybuilder, don't do any sports. Like, that's not at all what I'm saying. I'm just saying that I don't know that, you know, that other than simply just getting ahead of the game in terms of actually getting some, like growing some tissue and getting some of those adaptations. I don't know that for hypertrophy, you have to like start early, especially like with some bodybuilders, you'll look that like all of a sudden, like, you know, late in their career, especially in the enhanced world, all of a sudden they'll like, they'll do something where they'll just make a significant amount of progress in a very short period of time, you know, that's like disproportionate to other periods of time, whether that be like, oh, they finally figured out how to manage their recovery or they finally figured out their secret sauce recipe, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, so I think that kind of, that kind of weakens the argument that like, hypertrophy is going to be super impacted by prior development other than just the amount of tissue that you accomplish during those prior activities. Yeah. So having a buffer of skill leading into that might, you know, marginally increase the learning curve of the complex movements. I mean, and complex, we're looking at like a back squat is probably the most, uh, uh, the synchronized co-contracted skill-based movement that'll exist in the hypertrophy world. It's not like we're asking them to squat or a snatch or a clean and jerk or something like that. So, you know, your ability to do free throw, lay up, backswing, forehand probably has no real bearing on the low barrier of skill and joint sense needed to really go in and get the job done from a hypertrophy standpoint. Probably worth noting too, is it also like, you know, I'm talking about this stuff in general, but you could also look at like, you know, I'm, I'm looking at like, you could use whatever you wanted. You'd have all the tools available, but let's say like we're talking about somebody that they're going to pursue hypertrophy, but they're going to do it, you know, in their basement with just a barbell or, or something like that. You could argue that, well, then that context, those skills actually would be really valuable. Like coming in, if you're, if you, the tools that you had to start with were very limited, well, then having that stuff might make a bigger difference in that situation. So maybe that's the place to strong man that would be like, oh, yeah, I don't have a, you know, a hack squat and, you know, a perfectly balanced chest supported row machine or whatever. I'm just going to be, you know, flinging weights. Well, then then the skill component might actually serve as an acceleration there because those movements are more skill demanding. So having that coordination and whatnot may actually help in that situation but if we remove those limitations then i'd say it's it's hard to argue in principle yeah yeah i think it's i mean it, a conversation that spins off of that as we talk about local and global fatigue is muscles role as the sensory unit of effort which i think is is often times we look at uh fatigue and we look at failure as a decrease in gas like a decrease in gas pedal and you know, from a sensory standpoint, if we look at, um, and, and I, and it's funny cause you know, I've seen you post a lot about Charles and I think it's where we often find common ground if for no other reason, the impact on the industry. Um, but you know, I remember going down the fiber type, uh, rabbit hole at two X a all that. And I think one thing that got lost or maybe just diverted the conversation away is like, 
extrafusal, like with the contractile property of muscle in as a as a motor uh you know uh efferent versus a sensory input component of muscle as obviously a sensory uh uh afferent. Right. So we're getting this input in and this uh this output out. I, you know, I, I look at fatigue locally as not just a decrease in gas out through the motor aspect, but as a byproduct of a, an increase in sensory in. When we talk about local fatigue, you know, what is, and, and the, tie, the tie in here is like a person who comes from an athletic background, who trains in their basement with free weights and is a little bit rely, more reliant on that built joint sense, that built proprioception, uh, proprioception, mechanoreception, uh, the ability to kind of perceive their body in space. What role, when we talk about fatigue, um, does the muscles, does the muscle sensory input play in conjunction with the motor output in your opinion? Like how does that, like, will that person be able to push closer to failure for the very least they have a better awareness of their position or is failure more of a lack of output or a, a both or primarily a increase in input yeah i mean i think it's a we'll say it's like a it's like a flex flexible algorithm that you know changes over time with how you adapt right so we can we can change everything from a local level to you know like in terms of like the the biochemistry of what's happening at the muscle but then we can also change things in terms of you know basically how, how relative to the physiological state of the local tissue what is that sensory response right and like i mean part of the training adaptation process of like you know pushing harder is we basically become less and less sensitive to those fatigue signals so basically we experience the same perceived fatigue at a greater and greater physiological level of fatigue. Now, the interesting thing is, again, this comes, you know, there's such a big difference between like exercise selection because the sensory component is not just local. Like there's, there's a ton of other things that go into that, right? So the more coordination of an exercise and stability challenge, um, you know, the more respiratory, the more systemically demanding, you know, everything from blood pressure, you know, all of that goes into the perceived effort of an exercise. So you're going to see the most, I think, correlation between what's going on locally and failure when we're doing a more biased exercise. And I think that's that plays into like making that thing the limiter, right? It's like, okay, if I'm doing an exercise, I don't want it to feel like an RPE 10 because you know, I'm just tired of balancing this weight or I'm having a hard time breathing or my blood pressure has been like at a thousand for, you know, 40 seconds. I want, I want to feel fatigued because I'm reaching the contractile limits of the local tissue. And so, you know, in terms, in terms of the, you know, those two things there and what can happen, I mean, I think it's a constant state. I mean, we simply get better at, you know, controlling both nutrients in and metabolites out which, you know, and then we also like, we build a tolerance to that like the repeated bout effect isn't just something that helps like in terms of like your recovery from a tissue perspective, right? But it also affects like, like how you perceive each exercise. Like it's just simply like, um, just think of like when you haven't used a load for a while or something and all of a sudden you go in, you're like, oh shit, that's fucking heavy, right? And so the perceived, like the perceived heaviness of things, right? It's like, well, it's the same hundred pounds that it was, you know, three weeks ago or whatever. Why all of a sudden does now it feel like more than, a, you know, like more than it did last time. It's not that because a lot was changed. It's just that the sensory component has a built in like calibration. And so that repeated about effect that occurs physiologically kind of parallels what happens from a sensory and a psychological standpoint as well. Right. And so, you know, that I think, I think on both of those, we're looking at like, okay, yeah, you know, if you do something for, you know, three to four weeks, you're probably down to the point where you're, we'll say you're, the change in calibration is going to be very, very, very small, right? At that point in time. And now you're like, if you're, if you wanted to say, how well does my RPE correlate to like the legit effort? It's probably after one, you have a, you've developed some skill in the movement. And you've had about three or four weeks of exposure to it. 
right? But in between then, there's just going to be so many things that are constantly changing, right? And that's probably, I would say, that's for an experienced person. For a newbie, who knows? That might, there might be like a, a year of calibration going on for them, right? It's funny. I, we talked earlier about the, uh, you know, the, the global fatigue that comes from learning new skills and unstabilized movements and co-contracting like the squat versus the leg press for someone new and understanding like, well, okay, well, what's the variable trying to solve for? What's, what's your bottleneck? I look at, you know, introducing skill-based movements into new clients programs in the long-term runway of minimizing that as a bottleneck and then getting that, that, that margin down for a local stimulus to global fatigue. I look at like kind of, uh, how people would look at HRV and cardio. So it's like, you're going to see very generic early day programming, and it's going to include some sort of cardiovascular training for the very reason that you just said. And the parallel to like, look, I'm going to give you a skill-based movement now, because if I can teach you how to squat, I can really bury you on the leg press because the fatigue to stimulus ratio is so favorable to your ability to tolerate fatigue. It's the same thing with like interset recovery. It's like, look, you're winded doing bicep curls, it's like, we need to get you on some sort of cardio regimen so that we can narrow that margin and we can actually minimize that as a perception of fatigue, right? And I think off the backs of that, I, I, and it's, um, I think it falls in line with the trends of questions that I had, rep speed, because I think that's something that oftentimes gets pushed, not pushed the wayside. We talk about like concentric, eccentric velocities, their correlation to hypertrophy. But I think you mentioned something interesting that gets, past the wayside often is like the faster I contract a muscle, the greater the blood supply to the muscle. The faster I move, my heart's going to start to pump faster, right? So looking at like optimal, uh, I hate to use the word. I'm going to find a different word for us for the next hour. Banana. Optimal is banana. It's our safety word. The, what is the banana rep speed? Because we need to factor in. And obviously I think like most things, it'll plot this line of of skill or adaptability, um, both, you know, whether it's a metabolic flexibility, whether it's a neurologic flexibility, an ability to get in and out of different positions, learn skills faster. Rep speed as so far as it pertains to different bottlenecks. How, how, how pertinent is rep speed as a conversation as it comes to all of the variables we mentioned, from training to failure? Um, uh, stimulus fatigue ratio, and maybe digging even a little bit deeper, talking about eccentric versus concentric rep speeds and the effect of, of, of you know, the speed by which the muscles we're training are moving. Yeah. So, all right. So starting with like, you know, since you mentioned like, you know, heart rate and blood flow, right? So like intramuscular occlusion is basically tension based, right? And so like we, we have, I don't know if you're familiar with them. We have the Moxie monitors and we just got like the, um, the NX. So basically there, we can look at the amount, like the blood volume and how much of it, how much of that blood is oxygenated versus deoxygenated and whatnot. And it's, you no, know, it's pretty cool. And what you'll notice is that, yeah, when you're like, when you're managing heavier loads, then you create more occlusion right? And then when you're managing lighter loads, there's less. So simply the amount of blood flow that can get in and out is not so much of a, like speed is a factor, right? Because if you're trying to move the same weight faster, you do create more tension, but depending on what the resistance challenge of that exercise is, you may then also create a, a point in the exercise where the tension requirement drops. Like if you generate momentum, essentially what you do is you get like a, you know, a few milliseconds of higher occlusion and then a few milliseconds of lower. So there's, and I think, you know, this is one of the things that athletes find out in training is they figure out how to move load in a way that they can actually like almost like get some intra rep recovery, you know, sometimes with things, right. I and mean, that's part of what utilizing momentum is, is like, okay, you know, all you're doing is you're investing a little bit more energy in one part of the movement for an exchange of a little bit more recovery in another part, you know, of the movement. And I don't think that we have significant evidence one way or another to show that like, oh, you know, do I have to do one or the other? It's really, again, it just comes down to dosage of tension. Like if we're talking like through a hypertrophy lens, um, if you want to look at like, okay, how does rep velocity correlate to like effective reps or, you know, like, do we need to, you know, does, do we have to do reps slower or, you know, use a slower eccentric stuff for hypertrophy? Um, I think too many people get caught up on it's the speed that matters. And really, I think what, you know, if we're looking at actually modeling tension properly, right? 
we have, tension requires there to be force on both ends, right? So the muscle has to be pulling inward and then there has to be the external force. Like we need both of those things applying tension. So when I, if I produce the same amount of force within a muscle and all of a sudden that weight is now moving slower, right? That means that the actual net tension is higher because if I have the same amount of pulling force, but all of a sudden the thing is moving faster. That means there's less resistance. So the amount of tension. So really when we're looking at rep speed and we're like looking at like, well, okay, like, do I need to do like, do I need to slow down my reps for hypertrophy? It's like, no, the weight should just be slowing you down. And that's the element for hypertrophy. Like that's, that's the threshold you need to get to is where the weight is actually slowing you down. Cause now, now you're actually getting more tension force out of the same source of mass that you're that you're lifting if we're looking at the eccentric component um you know i it's kind of a catch-22 because the faster you go through the eccentric then the greater peak force there is stopping the load so we get a peak magnitude of tension but if we slow that down a little bit well then we kind of extend the time under tension and I don't think we really have a good case for one over the other. It does seem to be that if we were going to do slower eccentrics, that at about four seconds is maybe the point. Because I think the thing that we'd be capitalizing on is actually the passive elements, like being able to actually utilize Titan and the extracellular matrix and those things to tolerate. I mean, that's the reason that we can create more tension with less activation on the eccentric is, is there's a greater contribution of the passive elements to the tension. But also those passive elements have a thing where basically if you hold a stretch, they start to drop off, disengage. So like you can't just do the slowest eccentrics and think that you're going to be maximizing the utilization of those. I think somewhere around that four second window for a large movement is probably the point of diminishing returns, you know, but you could make the argument of doing slow things and pauses and stuff from a skill development from a pure hypertrophy standpoint. Like, yeah, like going too slow is probably bad and also going too fast might be like, you might not be gaining enough tension peak at the end of that to justify the loss of tension. And then there's also then just the safety regard. Like there's a certain point where disregarding, you know, tempo becomes a safety hazard. And then there's a point where being so neurotic about your tempo becomes a distraction from effort or potentially even a reduction in stimulus. So I bounced around there a little bit. I don't know if that covered all, all of the points there. Well, I think a little bit, I think about NFL combine kids that, you know, I've watched, I've been around the combine for about a decade now, and it's always interesting to see the different approaches to the 225 bench press. Mm -hmm. Now, undoubtedly, you know, you see 300 of the best athletes going into Indianapolis, Lucas Oil Stadium. It's the same dog and pony show. And every one of them has well-developed pecs, especially the guys who have big bench presses. And you bring up something super interesting, and it kind of comes back to like, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of bottlenecks, like what is actually slowing us down and the idea of momentum and the interset or inter rep uh, recovery. And it's something that you see because you'll see you know, guys who get into powerlifting, lose their hair, get into strength and conditioning, and they start to teach the bench press through the physiology of a fat old retired powerlifter, not understanding the metabolic capacity of the engine that they're getting to bench press because you see that rep speed and you've seen it go, go off the rails. Like, you, you know, you, I've seen people, plenty, plenty of people in preparation or heard stories of them tearing their pack and, you know, position related and all that. Like, it's not an ideal exercise to test the skill of a, a football player by any stretch of the imagination, but it's not going anywhere. And it's funny that you mentioned that, like, hey, they're generating, a, you know, a ton of force out of the bottom of that rep to recover a little bit more because the velocity isn't any detriment to their baseline ability to metabolically recover into rep because they're monsters, right? They're that they have such, they have such big engine. Talked a little bit about tension. And, you know, I think one of the things that catapulted the hypertrophy world forward was the, the attempt to collect the three figureheads, the, the uh, Mount Rushmore, of of hypertrophy stimulus right the schoenfeld study years ago that outlined mechanical tension muscle damage and metabolic stress and set forth into the world people uh, exploring these three or attempting to explore these three stimulus or stimuli in isolation 
we kind of know now that mechanical tension is kind of ruling the roost. Muscle damage might have a deleterious effect on hypertrophy. If you were to kind of put out an updated, hey, here's kind of what we think, whether it's a, uh, you know, three across the board, one, two, three, or one thing, and these are the byproducts. From a hypertrophy perspective, mechanistically, what are we looking at? Because, you know, we had like the, we had Milos on the show not too long ago. He'll talk about like hyperemia and he's obviously big into blood flow. What, what, when you look at the cross section of research and what's working anecdotally, where do you point your efforts at primarily, secondarily, and sort of at tertiary? Okay. So if we look at what can I do to lay down the most hypertrophy today, right? What's, what's going to produce the most protein synthesis? Mechanical tension is ahead by a mile if we're just looking at that window. Um, where the other things come in comes back to do i start to form bottlenecks at a certain point right like if i if i if i focus my programming simply around just maximizing mechanical tension do i get to the point where i start to have a metabolic bottleneck or do i get to a point where actually some of the positive adaptations that come from damage become a bottleneck because you know there there is overlap in all of these right like if, if we're if we're accruing mechanical tension, we're obviously getting some sort of metabolic stimulus, right? Like where we're expending some energy, but we may not be getting to the same cellular level of fatigue, you know, if I was directly going after those, because I'd be using maybe different rep ranges, different tempos, different rest intervals, exercise selection, all of those things, right? That we could use to capitalize on basically doing exercises that are intentionally inefficient from an energy system perspective, right? To tax those, like basically to increase the stimulus there and then increase the adaptation. So my philosophy is, is that if your goal is hypertrophy, you should be spending the majority of the time focusing on just how do I accrue the greatest mechanical tension stimulus, but then you should also basically take periods or blocks where you focus on those others so that you eliminate them from being the bottleneck. So the purpose of doing a metabolic phase is not for that phase to be producing the hypertrophy itself, but it's to eliminate any metabolic bottlenecks that would be reducing how much progress you make when you're focusing purely on mechanical tension. The same thing with either, you know, focusing on mechanical damage or, or whatnot, where you're like intentionally like, you know, or, or an overreaching phase, like, okay, can I actually like push the button that is going to give me some of these more like, Hey, you know, if I'm pursuing mechanical tension, I'm going to get a certain level of muscular damage and inflammation, et cetera. Right. If I'm just getting a little bit of those, am I essentially at my recovery limitation for those? So what if I focus on like over stimulating, pushing a little bit too far in that direction so that now when I'm doing my mechanical tension stuff, the inflammation is, oh, that's like nothing. It's very easy for my body to recover. So what I want is I want my metabolic performance and my recovery thresholds to exceed the demands of my tension programming. So what I do is I have my mechanical tension phase go for a while, and then I pay homage to those other adaptations to remove those. And I look for signs that those potentially could be starting to become weak points because there's also a like we're still stuck in the real world where we have to get a certain amount of performance in a certain amount of time, right? So you can't just keep resting infinitely in between sets, you know, like you, you have to be able to get a certain amount of stuff done. So there's going to be a certain amount of cardiovascular, you know, you know, adaptations that are going to be beneficial, not just to like, okay, performance in the set, but it's going to be, well, how much time do I need between sets? And it's also going to be like, how quickly can my body, you know, switch between fuel sources, you know, when I'm recovering and even, you know, how well do I sleep? So if we neglect those things, it's basically like, you know, one thing starts, you know, falling off at a time until eventually the actual limiter of our hypertrophy program becomes these other things. It's not like, well, how much more? The only re the reason I can't get more hypertrophy stimulus is because I'm so deconditioned into these other things that impact my performance and recovery. Yeah. So you're look. I mean, I guess my question coming out of that would be s s concurrent wouldn't allow you to push the thresholds of the bottleneck. So, you know, the idea of like a deload comes to mind and, and I think deloads are vastly misunderstood. And if I'm understanding the, the conceptual framework here, the idea is you're never deloading, you're reloading a particular 
potential bottleneck in a phase so that we can really get back to home base and push mechanical tension unfettered and with the capacity past really what we could enter into that mechanical tension phase with so that we can push mechanical tension without being interrupted by some of these, you know, extraneous bottlenecks. So the deload is not just decreasing mechanical tension, although that might increase your recoverability of the stimulus that is meant to adapt some of these other potential bottlenecks, but you're not meant to throttle those back. You should probably throttle those up in sessions where you're not, uh, or, or in a, in a, in a training block where you're not driving mechanical tension, you should be really trying to drive and push the or spin the plates, if you will, of these other potential bottlenecks. So we can get back to the show, which this show is obviously going to be mechanical tension. Got it. Now, moving from that, and we, we've talked along the timeline of scale a few times. Uh, now we sort of talked um, chronologically across uh, maybe some principles of programming, identifying some key bottlenecks. Um, interset variables you know, we have rest pause sets, we have uh, drop sets, we have um, uh, cluster sets, which you could probably put it with rest pause sets, supersets, things of the like. Efficacy, and we'll probably have to break these down individually, or we'll have to break these down individually. Efficacy, application, you know, fuck, marry, kill, cluster sets, supersets, and drop sets. Yeah, I mean, I think all of those, like, it... I would look at them in terms as like they're different ways of efficiency, right? Like hypertrophy, I still think comes down to the dosage. And these are just different ways of manipulating how much dosage am I getting in a per set or, or window window of time, right? Um, I think, you know, your rest pause variations, I would probably put at the, at the top of, of those things because you're able to work at the higher intensity and manage progressions and stuff. Like I think both in terms of practical application and the fact that it's probably the, it's very good for hypertrophy and also very good for strength kind of makes that one like maybe kind of the leader, right? Um, you know, whereas drop sets, you're continuing to work at lower and lower intensities over time, you know? And so for that, it's not going to have as much application for strength, but might still equally be good as an efficiency product for uh, hypertrophy. But, you know, you could look at one being one being a little bit more on the metabolic scale and one being a little bit more on the neurological, like, you know, you know, strength development scale. So, what what may be priority for one may be a different for another athlete depending on how they need to be able to express that you know if they have something on top of just just hypertrophy right and then a, it also comes down to you know what what's feasible for the exercise right so to me like so when i when i teach these methods um i teach small nuances but one of the most important things and like the first thing that you should just do is just eliminate the options that would suck Right. So like if I'm, do if I'm doing, you know, if I'm doing squats, you know, am I going to do a drop set? Like, am I going to rack it and then go pull some plates and like, and then rack it and then, like, you know, or am I just going to like stand, you know, take a couple deep breaths and then hit another rep, you know, or am I going to do a cluster where I could do a couple reps, take 20, like basically it's like, okay, why don't we just do the one that would practically suck the least knowing that all of these are essentially just ways of trying to get more stimulus in fewer total sets right and that that's kind of like how i look at it is like that's the first thing and then maybe you only have one option for the exercise anyway so who cares i love the nascar pit crew effort i love it i love, I love the whole production you're bringing in a geo spot no i don't need a spot i need you to ready wait for it i need you to peel plates peel plates yeah, training, and I think it's, you know, real world application training economy is so often lost in the sauce when, you know, we see stuff on social media, like the idea of a drop set in a pin loaded machine. I'm there. I'm there for it. Hold on, real. Done. Great. Yeah. Brilliant. Juji's got those things where if you drop it fast enough, they explode out like a firework, like a Roman candle. Yeah, training, uh, training economy is interesting. And I think one thing too that might come to like, with our ability to tolerate, I mean, really it comes down to like, I guess, tolerate pain is one thing that coincides with the ability to stay you know, in a good position of exercises that are, and maybe you don't choose exercises that aren't externally stabilized to do cluster sets in. But we see compensation exist in low skilled athletes as they look to more quickly recruit tissues on a chest press machine. 
but it, you know maybe you know, one variant that I see is like hmm, cluster sets versus drop. If the idea is to prolong uh, the, or the dosage of stimulus, it's one thing that I've often ran into is like, all right, for lesser skilled people, we might lean towards a drop where the tendency to compensate to local or, or sorry surrounding tissues might be a little bit higher a little bit sooner if we're trying to keep them under the high high load of a, of a heavier lift and then maybe as someone advances over time and they can kind of stay in that uh, coordinated pattern uh maybe we look at cluster sets and that's, that's like that's the one thing that i look at logically going like heavier weights higher dose less skill more compensation maybe maybe in a few months or maybe if it's even with like you mentioned earlier like maybe it's just a few weeks as you get better at this particular movement right that learning curve would obviously trend in the presence of external stabilization the learning curve is going to be higher in exercises that don't have uh, uh the, the amount of external support or reference but uh yeah it, it's funny because of all the science that you could go down. I like that you pulled it into the practical realm of like, do the thing that doesn't suck. Um, because it's, it is the big picture that I think a lot of people miss and the nuance is a ton of fun, but it's nice to know that like, at the very least, we're not promoting the pit crew behavior of peeling plates. Like, Oh, geez. Um, okay. So we talked, um, you know, Mount Rushmore, obviously going to be mechanical tension. We've talked uh, advanced, uh, training techniques. There's this kind of an age old debate. And I'm not sure if I, I, I know your um, your initial stance on it, which is why it was on the list of questions. You, you know, getting into this style of training, we start to learn resistance profiles and strength curves. One of the early things that people get taught is the idea of active range, right? Go into a leg press and pull your knee up. How high can you pull your knee from the plate before the set starts? That's as low as you should go in the leg press, right? Just a kind of a quick anecdote of how this is often taught. You know, there's going to be a ton of nuance. There's going to be a ton of context. Your thoughts on maybe let's start real high level, real simple thoughts on loading outside of an active range. Is it is it exercise specific? Is it tissue specific? Is it external environment specific? Is it lifter specific? Thoughts? Yeah. So the you know I think the there's a misnomer you know with the term active range. Like we're assuming that like the assumption that like okay once you get out of that that the muscle is no longer under tension. It's all on passive structures or whatever. I think that was a narrative that kind of came along with that just because of, of the name. Um, and so, you know, there's like, if, if you're getting buried into a leg press, like I don't care if it folds you up into a taco shell, like your glutes don't just go flaccid, you know, and your quads don't just shut off, you know, in there, right. Even if your joints are being compressed at that point, your body is trying to not, you know, dislocate your hip, you know, and impinge it and all that other stuff. So, um, so there's some, there's some problems with just the terminology. Now, in terms of going outside of it or not, I think really it depends on like how well you can gauge the orthopedics beyond that. Like, so you could look at like, if, if somebody can actively, you know, using the antagonist muscle, take themselves into a position that probably means that cool, we're going to be very safe working in this range. We're not going to have any orthopedic issues. If the antagonist tissue can take us there, we can probably go there under load and, you know, we're going to be good right now. But that doesn't mean that the agonist tissue wouldn't benefit from going into a longer position if the joint space is available. Like if it's orthopedically good, cool. You just have to be able to understand, like looking at somebody, how to evaluate that. So if you don't know what you're doing, I think, you know, using active range is a great way of like kind of giving yourself a, like, you know, some sort of safety net. Right. Um, but if you're going to be making the biggest improvements in people and stuff like that, you're going to have to try and figure out how do I get the most, like, especially now with what we're seeing in terms of, you know, research showing, Hey, you know, training muscles at longer length seems to be, you know, very, very beneficial. Um, and you know, if all you're doing is half repping the leg press, because that's as far as somebody's knee can bring to their chest, you might really be limiting their progress. Um, not to mention that you could make the argument that, you know, as long as it's controlled and it's orthopedically sound, actually exposing them to that other range of motion might actually be an important component for making that their active range of motion. Um, you know, and so I think, you know, whether or not you choose to go past that just depends on, 
how well you understand how to manage that and evaluate those positions. Because I mean, what's after active range, what's the next end stop pain, right? Or right. just like, like the joint just won't, I keep putting plates on the leg press and I can't get it to push him down any further, right? Like, like what, what is like, how do you evaluate that end stop? That is a more, you have to, that is a more technical decision to make as an athlete, as a coach, than than the active range. So that's, that's what I would say is, is like, whether or not you go past that should just be like, Hey, is, can I evaluate this? And then two, as you do that, you know, use appropriate load management. So maybe you scale back first and then work your progressions back up. If you're exposing to somebody to ranges that they otherwise wouldn't control, you know, maybe this isn't the place to do a heavy triple. Maybe this is a place to work in, you know, slower tempos, higher reps, pauses, et cetera, until you get better at evaluating that. And you know that they're not going to have, you know, arthritis at 23 after like three weeks of, you know, this program. Yeah. It's a, it's a good arthrokinematic, um, training wheels like hey if you don't know how joints work stop here right this is a yellow light for you um and i, I think also like external environment would play if i like you know the leg press active range versus the uh, squat active range it's, you know it's very similar in you know the sagittal steve uh free bar or free body diagram but very different in the internal environment right so it's just like you you do want to stay more towards the internal uh, or the active range on something less externally stabilized probably because the the options for compensation become exponentially more uh uh possible when it's like there's not there's only so many ways you can wiggle your way out of a leg press uh so I think, I mean, everything seems to trace back to a certain degree, like skill and external environment when it comes to stuff like that. Now you brought up like length of positions and obviously the, the prevailing uh, research. Um, and it's funny to see stuff come in vogue, right? Like there's things now where I remember looking at Charles Glass in muscular, this is magazine days. I would have been getting muscular development magazine days back in 2000 and Jesus, one another, six? 2006, that sounds right. 2005, yeah. 2006, I was still in high school. Um, anyway, you, you see things come back. And when they come back, they come back with a little bit mo more uh, you know, robust evidence outside of the anecdote. I've always kind of wondered where you know, stretching, as, static stretching as a, uh, as a modality, as an intervention, has a lot of, has, has real world application and efficacy undoubtedly now it has a lot of real world anecdotal uh, uh cases where it's been detrimental do you feel like length and positions of exercises and static stretching need to scale on the ability of that muscle to produce force like i feel static stretching over time as someone's relative strength at that muscle and respective joint increase the stimulus becomes far less Mm, I'm remiss to use the word effective, but it becomes relatively different to a joint that has a much greater capacity to handle load in a lengthened position. Because if you take someone like, and this, this might come from people in the research world who are maybe just disconnected from training applications, like, you know, training the elderly population, for example, where joint sense and, you know, you could look at muscle spindle research and you could look at, you know, how uh, interfusal muscle fibers are going to deteriorate and joint sense in elderly are going to uh, depreciate. And then you look at Golgi tendon organs tracing on a similar line over time. It's like static stretching in the elderly population where, uh, you know, elbow flexion strength Maybe the elbow flexors aren't great because they're not often restricted in range of motion. Let's use the hip, for example. Static stretching to a hip musculature that, that doesn't go, hasn't historically gone under any sort of eccentric or concentric load. Ha, you, they haven't trained hip abduction or abduction or flexion or anything. There's been no resistance training other than just walking, managing the forces of gravity. You can see a, a tremendous return, very transient, obviously. But is there a place for static stretching to be contextualized along a scale of like training muscles in a lengthened position? If we look at the actual starting metabolic neurologic state of the muscle itself, does that do you, do you kind of understand the, the link I'm trying to make? Yeah. Well, if we start with just like, what's the potency of, of the two in general is that 
to get the same amount of stimulus from static stretching relative to resistance training is the it's the difference between hours and minutes, right? Like you have to stretch for like, and I mean, under a constant tension stretch for hours a week to get the same amount of stimulus as minutes of mechanical tension from resistance training exercise, you know, like, you know, whatever, you know, like, you know, eight sets of 10, you know, or whatnot. It's like, it's going to take you five hours of static stretching to get a similar hypertrophy, you know, response, something, something around that realm. Right now, if, if we look at what's going on mechanistically with those, like, cause if we're looking at a passive stretch, the, that's, that's the different thing going on mechanically within the tissue, because when we're active, that changes the conformation of Titan and whatnot. So we're actually stretching different things when we're doing an eccentric or a loaded stretch than when we are, when we are, when we are passive stretching. So as you get stronger and you get more and more tissue and whatnot, the, probably the disparity between the benefits of the two from a stimulus perspective uh, probably goes down. But the other caveat and, you know, this is something that, you know, maybe some people want to play around with is, you know, what is the, other than the time cost, like what is the fatigue cost of static stretching, right? You know, so maybe, you know, cool elderly population, you know, they're very weak, not like, what is the, what, what type of skill demand is there to do a static stretch? Like, like very, very low, right? What's the, what's the injury risk? What's the, you know, coordination, et cetera. So for for people where it's like, Hey, I can't, I can't do a certain movement. Maybe that's something we're actually using static stretching could be a way like to kind of either help maintain or regain actually some hypertrophy and strength while not having like any risks associated with it. But in terms of eff efficacy, like if you have the ability to train something, then, then train it. Right. Um, but and then on the counter side of that is, is that, you know, some people look at like, well, Hey, if I'm just training through full range of motion and whatnot, then I have all the mobility in the world. Well, you have basic, like, it's good. It's good for maintaining mobility and especially increasing mobility. If, especially if there's like a neurological limitation or some sort of strength and balance, you know, or they couldn't quite co-contract, et cetera. Right. Look cool. Then you can gain a lot of range of motion with strength training. But if you're talking about like drastically improving, improving mobility, then the dosage for static stretching, like that's where it goes up. Like you can get immediate changes in people doing, you know, very short stretching or doing simple exercise drills or PNFs, all of these things, but the permanence of those is very low. So, you know, that, that I think that's the other side of the coin is like for long-term range of motion, mobility gains, static stretching is still, is still king. But if you don't need more, training is probably a very, very good maintenance and it's the best for having functional use of that range. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, mean, I, I zero in on the elderly population just from like a dosing perspective, right? Like it's something that's, it's and really not even from a hypertrophy standpoint either. Like the idea of joint sense being a prerequisite. Like I think it's something in the way I, I kind of conceptualize movement and assess for skill. It's like, do we have a high resolution motion capture internally? Call it cerebellar function, call it proprioception, call it sixth sense, call it whatever. It's like, you know, we're going to continue to run into and, you know, kind of per our conversation earlier about squatting and athletes and it's like, well, how, co how coordinated does it get? How coordinated does it need to be? It's like, well, how coordinated is the person that's starting with? Because for me, it's like I want to work with a high resolution motion capture where, you know, the coordination is or at the very least not coordination, like a fundamental unit of coordination is knowing where you are. What you do with that positional sense is the other side of the coordination coin. But I think if you can't, if you're dealing with again, elderly populations where all the light switches are turned down from a sensory input and motor output. Like to me, it's something where it, it, it might run an anal, like not run an analog per se, but you know, it could be comparative of like, you know, if we're dealing with a 25 year old male who's uh, been resistance training for a number of years. Yeah. Lengthen positions to maintain control and active range and improving active range or mobility or whatever you want to call it. But does static stretching fit on a relative 
timeline of ability or 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 yeah timeline of ability to someone who's not that right as we start to deal in these specialized populations rehabilitation post op you know this if we start to look at the muscles ability and like the muscles role as a sensory input mechanism i think really when we when we steer the conversation towards our mechanoreception or proprioception and we look at like full joint replacements right like if we think about like joint capsules and we think about golgi tendon organs if i'm replacing an entire hip socket what is giving me my feedback now well it's like it's it's going to be the you know the the interfusal property of the muscle and then we're going to look to have to re-stimulate some sort of golgi tendon organ is like this thing is titanium now right the joint capsule is a free nerve ending so I, i'm just curious in your thoughts of that that principle potentially mechanistically scaling up in you know in, in specific cases like is static stretching does static stretching in maybe more loaded lengthened positions not against some sort of conventional resistance does it trend on a similar adaptation not even from my personal but from a joint sense perspective as far as hey this is super useful for people to know where their joints are relative to one another I think, I mean, I think PNFs would be the place that I would lean for that, right? Yeah. Like, I think, yeah. I think for that type of mechanism, that's the, I think that's the, the best bang for your buck you could go over versus just pure, pure static stretching, you know. And you can, you can look at that both from like, you know, physiologically what's going on, but also simply just like from a person that has, you know, we call them a motor moron or whatever they want. They just don't know how to contract whatever. Like if we can passively put that stretch or that, you know, that sensory into that tissue, then their ability to reciprocally engage that tissue then goes, goes up tremendously. Right. So there's a, there's an assisted education aspect to those as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I, I mean, I, the idea of improving and i guess it's uh, i mean the over prescription where is where these things become problematic right like how much joint sense does a 25 year old year old person need right like do we get enough variability and exposure because you kind of hinted to this principle of when we talked about margin for error and we were talking about squatting it's like yeah under that type of a maximal load the margin for error is probably going to give you at the very least a magnitude stimulus of change in position, right? As muscles become more sensitive, you know, what do we, what benefit are we getting from these more underloaded? That's not giving us that same relative magnitude. So it's something where, you know, obviously things, the popularity of warming up and activation and all this is, is been, is as in vogue now as it's ever been. But I think just understanding exclusion criteria for when things become useful um what are the and, and uh, this was kind of last on my list of questions that i want to be super mindful of your time if fields of inquiry things that you're looking at that you go hmm i'm not sure if anyone's looked at this yet or i'm going to revisit a concept that maybe has been looked at in the past but we're going to do it a slightly different way obviously hypertrophy centric is primarily where you know the majority of your efforts go academically What's like on your radar right now where you're like, this is super interesting. I might not know it through end to end, but it's something, it's a theory that I'm, or a thread that I'm pulling on that I think might be the next thing, whether it's, uh, you know, external, like an application of external load, whether it's dosages of volume, what's like got you excited about, you know, the future of hypertrophy research or even just training in general? Um, I mean, mostly just the arguing back and forth. That's the most exciting thing, right? Uh, that, that, that's that new research. That's what it does is it creates a, a chance for somebody to be happy and somebody else for their, like their life just to be in shambles every, every time a new study comes out. So that's the best part. It's just watching that, watching that cycle for the people that have pitted their identity on, well, here's what we think right now. And then when the pendulum swings the other direction, then, you know, um, but I think, you know, my, my area of focus has never been like, oh, it's this one thing. It's really putting the different things together because that's what we have to do as coaches, right? Like you, you don't write a program and you're lo looking at the lens of like, oh, well, let's just look at the volume research, right? Or, or whatever it is, right? It's like, okay, I have to consider all of the things that, that go into this. And so the putting the things together. So, you know, the accumulation of more things is good, but also I think with more and more applied research, 
it to me it just comes down to like more and more of like hey you know this should be an end of one decision you know hence the the branding right uh and and that like you have options right like that you know you don't like you don't there isn't like one path to get there right like like okay, there's like there isn't a perfect way to become mr olympia that we can apply to everybody right is that every there's going to be a deviation across the board in terms of not only what exercises but the individual techniques and you know how much volume this person uses and how much intensity and proximity to failure etc and whatnot and not not just like for an individual but also how you manage it for that individual over time because the you know the person that i am today is not the person that i was 10 years ago in terms of you know what's going to work for me in in training right like for sure now that um yeah there's a four at the front of that that number now right so uh it's definitely definitely not the same so like the things that i'm finding exciting is is that we're it's just this fact that we're accumulating enough data that some of these pendulums are actually swinging to the middle right so like okay should we train to failure or really far away and you know, should we do all the sets or none of the sets, you know, and all of the stuff. And I think we're starting to have enough individual data points as well as enough like, oh, well, this study found this and this study found the other thing is it's like, hey, look at this. For some participants, they benefited from this and some participants that or whatever. So that means that, okay, there's some individual relativity and really kind of meeting somebody where they're at is probably the most important way to apply these principles rather than looking at this thing good this thing bad right so you know that's that's kind of where i'm looking at it and then you know i don't know that we're going to in my lifetime at least that we're going to get to researching the things that i'm focusing on teaching right now which is like the very practical uses because there's just there's so much to figure out and that take you the, you need so many studies to break down all these individual things but i think at least getting to the point where people are open to the conversation of like hey you know person a person b person c they can all have programs that are all principle based but they're leveraging those principles a little bit differently for their body their structure their goals their current physiology their time etc right like cool we talked about cluster sets drop sets you know if you don't have a lot of time, man, that's a great way to get more work done and, and, and fewer sets, right? What about just simply resting less? Like my, like that's one of my favorite examples of this is looking at the research on rest intervals, right? Like the, the, the TikTok version of rest intervals is like, if you don't rest exactly three minutes that you get zero hypertrophy, like you get last place in the hypertrophy race. Like if you rest two minutes and 45 seconds, like no gains, right? You might as well not, not even train if you don't rest like, like three minutes. And then it's a study that's not even that new, but it just basically, it's like, Hey, if we equate for volume and the people that are resting shorter, just keep working for the same amount of time, they get the same results. And we, we, I repeat this in practice with like when we had a, a hypertrophy camp here um, a couple of weekends ago, and we did this, we had people do two minute rest on one arm and three minute on the other. And we tracked their volume load across different exercises. And most of them had a little bit more volume load in the short rest group, right? And so really it's like, okay, so do you need to do a magical three amount of reps? Or is it like, hey, if you have 60 minutes to get into the gym, is it actually just more important that you fucking bust your ass for those 60 minutes, right? And that's gonna be, the, that's going to be the most important thing for, you know, people that aren't 23 that basically just go and they sit at the gym from like five to eight with their tripods or whatever and have unlimited time, right? For people that have like, you know, real things to do, jobs, et cetera. It's like, cool. If you have four hours a week to train, probably, you know, doing straight sets with, you know, four or five minutes in between is not the way to get the most results out of, out, out of your programming, right? Especially from a hypertrophy or body composition, obviously for strength, there's, you know, there's certain things that we have to do in terms of being able to maintain performance. But since most people training have some sort of physique oriented goal, it's like, okay, probably most people, if they were to apply the rest research of like, Hey, just rest a lot and maximize the performance across your sets, probably leave more stimulus on the table than the person that's bouncing around like a spider monkey, like in reality. Right. But you know, so I think that's, that's interesting is seeing that, 
some of these studies that have been done that were missing key variables, we're now getting enough stuff done to like pull them back in. So it's like, oh, hey, it's not rest longer or rest shorter. It's actually, if you have 20 minutes, get the most out of that 20 minutes. Like if you got 20 minutes to train chest, you know, you, you just need to, you just need to find whatever balance of what you can get to train chest for more, you know, as much as possible for 20 minutes. That volume study is another kind of like good example. I haven't actually put out an opinion on this. I don't know if I'll have one out by the time that this airs, you know, but the group that worked up to like 52 sets and everybody's like, oh, you can't do 52 sets of, of quads or whatever you would die, you know, and understanding that like, well, they did, they, they, they did two minute rest, right? So they did 52 sets of two minute rest. Now I'm, I'm pretty sure that even if I gave you leg extensions and I made you train to uh, two reps in reserve, two minutes rest is not going to be a lot of recovery, right? No. So what's interesting is, it's like, okay, so if you actually timed this out and look at volume load, and then you compared that to like full recovery, they're actually like, okay, cool. Like maybe they're actually only doing the volume load equivalent of what a person that would be resting for five minutes. Maybe that's like the equivalent to like half or 40% of the number of sets, but they're just using a, we'll say a, we'll say a, an incomplete rest method. So the set count is high over that time because the rest period is short. But what would be very interesting is like, hey, why don't we run that same high volume group? And it's like, all right, cool. And if we do the same thing. We do the, the change in rest interval because that's exactly what happened is, is that in that rest study, well, the group that rested a shorter amount, they did more sets over time, but they didn't benefit. They didn't get more hypertrophy when they did about the same you know, volume load. Right. So I think understanding the data better is what I'm excited about because we've had so much research that was not done well enough or with en like with enough of these variables that it was very easy for people to just like make like a simple conclusion and a simple story from the research. I know that's probably not the, like the controversial, like, Oh, you know what I'm excited about is, is that, you know, full ROM is stupid and lengthened ROM is better. Right. But yeah, cool. You know, yes. Yeah. You know, team, team only partials or <laughs> whatever you would want to do. It, right. Um, I mean, that's cool. But really the thing that excites me is actually being in a position now where, we're starting to bring the pendulum to the middle on some of these things. And then understanding that you have N of one flexibility with the different like kind of levers that you can push for these things, you know, like, cool. If you want to train closer to failure, do fewer sets. If you fucking hate pushing your sets close to failure, then, then, then do more sets, right? If you want to do shorter rest, cool, but still do 20 minutes of chest you know, right. It's just, you're going to do more sets in that 20 minutes. Like, like there's all sorts of things, right. You know, that you can, that you can do and get the same outcome with hypertrophy because it's more dosage. It's the most flexible of the pursuits you could say, right. Like if you're, you know, if you're focusing on purely on endurance or purely on strength, your training options become more constrained, but for hypertrophy, it's like you have just different ways to get the dosage in and, you know, you can work out what's most efficient for that person ramble over. Yeah. I think it's just, I mean, it's an interesting time of intersection of like people in the space and the need for like, you mentioned the word principles a few times. I think for the longest time we used, or, you know, the, the collective industry used research to prove things right or wrong rather than using principles to figure out what is works or what is right or wrong for each individual person. So like a principles based approach seems to be the, the, if there's a meta trend happening in the people and the voices in the industry that seem to be making the most amount of noise now, which is great. It's those that are you know looking at things nuanced from a principles perspective. Um, and I appreciate you taking the time, man, and, and sharing some of your principles with us. Uh, we'll have to run it back. Uh, and maybe we do it WWE style. Maybe we sell Netflix, or maybe we sell pay-per-view things and we just do what, all right, gloves off. Let's fucking, let's duke it out. Let's pick a thing and let's just fucking go at it. Uh, but no, I appreciate, like I, I, you know, like I said, as, as someone who's, um, uh, well, watched a few of your podcasts and, you know, the, the, read a few of the comments back and forth where you just pillory people in the comment section. Um, it's, it was cool to be able to just get kind of an open forum as far as, you know, some of the principles that dictate the decision-making process. And I think that's showing your work is something that I, you know, I advocate to trainers and coaches, like, how did you arrive at this decision? Um, 
because there aren't, you know, a lot of the everything works, uh, nothing works every time. Not entirely true, but more often true than not. And I think being able to watch you kind of like put the stuff down on paper in front of everyone and be like, hey, here's what we think for this, 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 and this. Because I think long are the days of, well, that depends. And that being kind of the academically inclined answer. It's like, well, that depends on what. And then what do you do in each use case that it has a dependent outcome? So yeah, I, I really appreciate you taking the time, man. This is long overdue, as I'm sure the audience will agree, as you like, as mentioned, most requested guest to date. Um, I mean, any anything, anything you want to close on, anything you want to wrap, um, feel free. The floor is yours. If not, I'll just hand out the laminated Joker cue card with all your credentials uh, at the end of this as well. If you don't feel like running it back, yeah. No, I mean the the one message that I would like to get, and this is something that we actually talk like heard of, at Swiss a lot too, right? Is is that you know I think it's great being able to have these long form conversations, um, but my message for everybody that like, if, if you like this stuff, go do something in person, right? Because nothing is like, nothing is going to deliver that, right? Like we can talk about all of these things, but if people don't actually experience the impact of these things at an in-person seminar or whatever, right. You know, so you have yours that you do, right. And I have mine that I do, et cetera. Like, I think that's, that's the one thing that I've just, you know, that's the message I want to keep getting out is, is like, Hey, and I also just think that as an industry, we can benefit like, the FaceTime is something that we, we need a lot more of, right? You know, I mean, having the podcast and all the virtual content and, you know, being able to reach more people is great. But also I think that, you know, our industry, especially with the egos and stuff involved, having the real FaceTime makes, makes a huge difference. Right. And I can say that for me, for my success, like a lot of it's been the relationships that I've met, you know, that I've made it courses, seminars, et cetera, not necessarily with the, even the person that I came there, but just like the person sitting in the chair next to me, you know, so yeah. get off your butt, get on a plane, you know, go, go actually, go actually get hands on, um, with Jordan or myself or, whoever the hell that you want to want to go learn with. Right. I mean, even if it's wrong, you're going to know it a lot sooner doing it in person than you are you yeah. know, reading our books or whatever. Awesome. Man. Well, hey, I, I, again, I appreciate your time. Uh, it won't be the last time we do it. We'll have to do something in person as is, uh, as was the, as was the closing remark. So again, man, I appreciate it. Thank you so much.